Very good morning all of you. This is Dr. M.C. Nataraja, Professor from the Department of Civil Engineering, MSRIT, Bangalore. I welcome all my students to the session 3 under the module 4, which is on design of beams. The subject, design of steel structural element, 18 CV 61. Well, students, if you recollect uh, what is that we were discussing in the previous class? I was mentioning about uh, the secondary failures uh, that can happen in the eye section. These are all the roll section consisting of flanges and web. And because of uh, the thinness of the element, where the width of the element is uh, somewhat uh, considerable compared to the thickness, the ratio of the width of the element to the thickness is really the factor that controls the buckling. With reference to this, we have seen the buckling of the web. Buckling of the web in the previous class, buckling of the web is also referred to as uh, the column buckling or the vertical buckling, where the web behaves like a column. And because of that, uh, the element undergo premature failure. So before the element reaching the heat stress, so at a lesser stress, the material fails and based on that stress, we need to determine what is the load carrying capacity of the web and that is what the load probably will be able to apply as a reaction or even as a concentrated load on a bearing plate supporting that load. So very similar to the web buckling. So where uh, the effect is the behavior in the form of a column as far as the web is concerned. Slenderness ratio of the web comes into picture. The slenderness ratio is the one which really decreases the load carrying capacity. So similar to uh, this type of uh, buckling, we also notice uh, some sort of a buckling that happening at the junction of the web and the flange as you can see here. And uh, this is where the concept of web crippling comes into picture. So this is uh, what uh, I want to introduce to you uh, in this uh, present class. So kindly see when the beam is supported on a uh, supporting plate called as the bearing plate. So enormous reaction do come into picture and that reaction is uh, distributed over the width and of course uh, we also have certain length of the bearing plate maybe equal to or slightly less than the width of the uh, beam. So width of the beam is uh, this much so the plate width also be to this extent or it can be slightly more or slightly less depending on the situation. So what is the width of the plate you are seeing uh, along the length of the beam? So that is where this stiff bearing width of the plate comes into picture and that is what the width uh, referred to as B1 as far as this particular uh, diagram is concerned. Now in fact when you apply a reaction here, so because of the load coming on the beam, there is a reaction and from the edge of the bearing plate, so we have to take a dispersion angle which is having a slope of 1 is to 2.5. But if you see the previous case of a column buckling, so we will be taking the dispersion angle which is at 1 is to 1 proportion means uh, the angle is 45 degree and we will be determining the distribution of the stress uh, exactly at the center where the column buckling is maximum. But in this case uh, the buckling happens at the junction mainly because of the concentration of the stress. Enormous stress gets concentrated here. It is mainly because of the fact that there is a substantial width of the cross section coming into picture and also we have certain width of the stiff bearing plate coming into picture. So the reaction is acting over certain area where we have a substantial area load by area where area is substantial so we have a lesser stress. But when you go to the junction where the stiff bearing width this stiff bearing width even though it is constant but if you see the width of the section, the width of the section is uh, something like B1. So that width of the section decreases to as low as few mm. That is where the thickness of the web comes into picture. So the area which is really resisting the load is really, really less. So that is where the heavy concentration of the stress comes into picture at this particular junction. So a yeah, lesser value of the stress because of larger area of the bearing plate and corresponding contact of the flange but when you come to the junction where 
that contact area is uh, substantially reduced and as a result of that a sudden rise in the stress happens at this junction and that is what the stress that really causes uh, the crippling of uh, certain portion of the web at the bottom where the concentrated load is acting and in order to reduce that concentrated stress to certain extent uh, so the web is not connected to the flange straight away where some sort of a transitional change in the thickness happens as you can see here so this is uh, what is uh, referred to as the root of the fillet and we have certain constant thickness of the uh, flange and later the thickness of the flange is gradually increased in the form of a arc you can see here it is a quadrant of a circle and at some point uh, the thickness of the web starts and that thickness is constant over certain height and this fillet having certain radius is provided in order to reduce the concentration of the stress at this level definitely you can reduce the stress to some extent but it is really not possible to make the stress almost negligible so that is the reason whether we like it or not just at the onset of the constant thickness so the point where the constant thickness the prismatic thickness of the web starts so that is the point uh, where too much of accumulation of the stress comes into picture and that is where we need to see the stress distributed over certain width of the web taking this dispersion angle as 1 is to 2.5 so this is nothing but going by a vertical width of 1 that is where 1 comes into picture and going by a horizontal width of 2.5 so in fact uh, this n2 is 2.5 times of this depth so what is what is this depth is very important in the design and that is nothing but the depth of the root of the fillet that is where root radius comes into picture and this particular value you can get it from the steel table depending on the uh, designation of the I section and in fact uh, that is nothing but the thickness of the flange plus the radius of the root so if you add these two things uh, we are going to get the depth of the root of the fillet from the outside so this is what is taken as uh, depth 1 and 2.5 tons of that is what the horizontal spread and with that so you will be able to identify this particular point where the width exactly at this particular point where the concentration of the stress is uh, happening it is b1 plus n2 so this is what the width multiplied by of course the thickness of the element at that section is uh, the thickness of the web so thickness of the web multiplied by this length b1 plus n2 is what the area that is resisting the stress so the reaction whatever you have uh, at uh, the support divided by this particular area so we are going to get the stress to which uh, the junction is subjected so if that stress exceeds the yield stress of the material the design yield stress of the material so then really the crippling of the web at the junction takes place uh, in the way i have shown in the figure so we don't want uh, that to happen and we need to ensure that uh, the stress at this level is always be less than the yield stress of the material then only this type of web crippling can be avoided what students should know about this web crippling is it is because of the concentrated effect of the load acting as a reaction or the load could be acting anywhere along the span of the beam. It is mainly because of the stress uh, accumulated at the junction. So even though there is a fillet, uh, a gradual change in the thickness, still we have the concentrated effect and that is the one that causes the failure of the web in the form of a crippling. The crippling means a sudden change in the size kindly say here the sudden change in the shape where certain portion of the web is in fact going either to the left or to the right in the form of a buckling so this is not the buckling actually this is some sort of a yielding what is happening in some portion of the web and it is very similar to buckling but the buckling will happen at a stress less than the yield stress but this is what the type of uh, uh, deformation the material at the junction undergoes and this is mainly because of the yielding and hence it is referred to as the crippling and not the buckling so this is where the student should appreciate the web crippling and this is also sometimes 
refer to as the curling of the web near the junction. Web curling or web crippling means one and the same and the stress causing that is the yield stress not the uh, buckling stress which is less than the yield stress as we have in case of a column buckling. So anyway let us uh, take the another uh, uh, concept the behavior of a laterally unsupported beam. So in fact uh, whatever I explained uh, in the earlier slides is something connected with uh, the restrained beams and uh, in fact I have explained as to how the beam can be, can be restrained and there are uh, different ways and means uh, with which you will be restraining the lateral movement of the member. Otherwise if you have a I-beam something like this where it is really not uh, supported in the lateral direction and there is a very possibility even though the load is applied symmetrically and because of one particular property of the uh, cross section where the moment of inertia of the section about the centroidal axis that is i with respect to zz here i with respect to zz is substantially greater compared to the i in the other orthogonal axis kindly say this is what the vertical axis the axis of uh, symmetry and that axis of symmetry is the minor principal axis and if you see this one this is another axis of symmetry being the major axis and about the major axis the moment of inertia is absolute maximum and that value of yz many times greater compared to the moment of inertia with respect to y axis passing through the centroidal axis and if you take the ratio of yz by iy it is generally in the range of 20 to 50 and sometimes 50 to 100 in case of plate girders it is still more than that as a result of that if you see the behavior of the compression flange so this is the compression flange where uh, enormous uh, bending stress comes into picture so this particular portion because of the susceptibility to bend in the lateral direction it undergoes buckling and that buckling since it happens in the lateral direction it is what is referred to as the lateral buckling and this lateral buckling is because of the bending effect initially we have the bending effect and later that bending effect transform itself into a sort of torsional effect so both bending comes into picture later torsion comes into picture and the buckling or the bending that is happening is in the lateral direction so that is where uh, this particular phenomenon is uh, referred to as lateral torsional flexural buckling or lateral flexural torsional buckling or simply lateral buckling so what really the shape of the cross section when you take either the simply supported beam into consideration or the cantilever beam is considered how this uh, lateral torsional behavior looks like now kindly say here i have taken a cantilever beam where one end of the beam is uh, completely fixed and uh, we have the uh, free end where in the free end uh, i am uh, supporting a vertical load if I support a vertical load exactly here, though the section is symmetric, kindly say we are under the impression that uh, the beam is bending with respect to one particular plane. Of course, initially the bending happens in the vertical direction as if it is confined to one plane. But when you have applied certain load, which causes certain amount of moment, from that instant and later, the compression flange, if you see, it is not only undergoing bending in the vertical direction it is also undergoing bending in the lateral direction at the same time if you see the section the section is also undergoing rotation so with respect to the centroidal axis we will be seeing the movement of the cross section in the vertical direction we will be seeing the movement of the cross section in the lateral direction but if you see the shape of the cross section the shape of the cross section is also undergoing rotation so there is a rotational deformation the lateral deformation vertical deformation so everything is going to happen and the combined effect of that uh, is what this particular shape is and also see what exactly is happening to the free end and see the profile right from the free end and going in a going in a transitional manner till you have the section where it is being fixed and try to observe the entire profile so with your naked eye only you will be able to make out this is really not uh, the bending 
the bending is happening but it is not only happening in the vertical plane it is also happening in the horizontal plane but at the same time the cross section is also undergoing rotation so that rotation is this twisting and the bending in the horizontal direction is what is referred to as the lateral effect and you also have the vertical effect vertical effect lateral effect and the rotational effect so two types of bending plus one rotation and all the three if you put together it is the flexural effect and also torsional effect the whole thing is referred to as torsional flexural buckling so obviously all properties of the cross section plays an important role iz controlling the vertical uh, bending and iy controlling the horizontal uh, bending and also the combination of iz plus iy so that is where uh, the polar moment of inertia which controls the twisting effect so these are all the things uh, that need to be considered while formulating an expression for uh, the resistance of the beam at the onset of this type of a behavior and if you identify the moment at which this type of a uh, behavior starts uh, is what is referred to as uh, the critical stress the critical stress at which this type of a lateral buckling happens is what is referred to as uh, the elastic critical stress because the stress is always be less than the yield stress and the moment corresponding to that situation is referred to as uh, the critical moment and that critical moment is always be less than the yield moment the fully plastified moment the stress is also sometimes uh, less than the yield stress so because of this uh, the stress is uh, referred to as the elastic critical stress associated with the moment called as elastic moment or the critical moment corresponding to this type of a situation now if you see one more uh, problem a problem on a simply supported beam where the span is somewhat uh, considerable is a long span beam so if you have a medium span beam the behavior is controlled by not only bending but also by shear to some extent but if you have a short span beam as you know the behavior is more controlled by the shear effect rather than the bending effect but here we are taking a long span beam obviously the bending moment is quite predominant the shear effect near the support is rather less but what happens in uh, this type of a section if you kindly see here the situation so you have a span l subjected to a load w but kindly see in the initial stages of uh, applying the load the cross section near the center undergo deflection in the vertical direction so that is where the cross section which is like an i section it starts deflecting vertically downwards and kindly see the vertical deflection so this is where uh, nothing has happened to the cross section but it has taken a different shape and by the time we have already applied certain load and certain moment now from this stage onwards if we increase the load on the beam what happens so this particular i section not only undergo deflection in the vertical direction it bends further in the vertical direction but at the same time it starts to move in the horizontal direction also but the magnitude of the vertical deflection where the entire cross section is tending to deflect downwards but at the same time if you see the compression flange of the beam that is tending to move in the lateral direction also so that is where the horizontal movement of the cross section comes into picture but if you increase the load further and further so we have the additional vertical deflection or the movement and also we have the horizontal movement and thereby the position of the section will be different but at that time the cross section also undergoes some rotation with respect to the centroid all the three effects we are seeing in this particular diagram so one certain vertical movement has happened now kindly say for additional vertical movement we have a substantial horizontal movement thereby the final position of the cross section after the buckling has started will be something like this so if you take uh, the centroid of uh, this particular cross section with respect to the original so that is where the vertical movement the movement of the centroid with respect to the original in the horizontal direction so that is where the horizontal movement so corresponding to that location the section is not like what it was uh, before applying the load 
but it undergoes a rotation. So if you extend the centroidal axis passing through the centroid in the vertical direction, that substance an angle of theta with respect to the vertical. So this is where the twisting of the cross section comes into picture. So the combination of the horizontal moment, the combination of the vertical moment and the rotation, all these things uh, we are measuring with respect to the centroidal axis, with respect to the original position and uh, the corresponding final position, what exactly the horizontal, vertical and then the twisting effect being the uh, rotational effect or the theta effect. So the entire thing makes the cross section to cross section to look something like this. So this is where uh, the laterally deflected shape of the beam comes into picture and the phenomena associated with uh, this type of a behavior is what is referred to as lateral torsional flexural buckling or simply the lateral buckling or lateral torsional buckling. So this is mainly because of the fact that the moment of inertia about uh, the vertical axis is rather very less. But about horizontal axis it is quite substantial and it is many many times greater compared to the value what we have in the vertical direction. And now uh, this is uh, the stage where uh, we need to know what exactly the buckling uh, we are talking of in the column. I section is a column that is of course in the vertical direction but I have shown it in the horizontal direction as you know in case of a column we are always applying the longitudinal load the longitudinal centroidal load but here the column is in the horizontal direction but still I have applied the horizontal load where the entire cross section is subjected to compression not only the top flange and even the bottom flange the whole of the cross sectional area is subjected to compression so that is very very important uh, in a compression member whether it is vertical or horizontal now kindly see the similar type of uh, behavior in a beam so this is what uh, you have seen it so kindly see how the beam is uh, moving in the vertical direction so kindly see this one this is what the original uh, uh, position of the eye section so this is what the centroid and kindly see the centroid in the final position so this is the position so this particular point if you want to push it to this particular point so kindly see so the way it is moving it is moving horizontally and then it is moving vertically so kindly observe the cursor horizontal moment then the vertical moment so corresponding to that situation your eye section is not vertical i it is taking an inclined position so thereby theta comes into picture so you have the horizontal effect so you have the vertical effect and also you have the theta effect and which part of the cross section is mainly responsible for this type of a thing to happen so that is the compression flange so that is where the lateral movement comes into picture associated with twisting effect or the torsional effect but if you see the same cross section in a column i have put the column in the horizontal direction so that you can compare the behavior with that of the beam so kindly see what is happening to the cross section at the center so this cross section if you take it as this cross section being the original position before you apply the load when you start applying the load so this compressive load then the entire cross section buckles mainly because of the slenderness ratio so the span of the column and of course the cross sectional area is known and also you know the moment of inertia also you know the uh, radii, radii of gyration with respect to the horizontal axis and also with respect to the vertical axis so you will be able to calculate where the slenderness ratio is maximum so with respect to y y the slenderness ratio is maximum so we need to calculate uh, the radius of gyration with respect to the weak axis which is the vertical axis so the effective length of the column or the effective height of the column divided by that radius of gyration is what the slenderness ratio and that slenderness ratio introduce what is known as column buckling so the initial position of the cross section is something like this that will take a new position something like this and if you see what is the type of movement that has happened it is only the horizontal movement so this is what we see in the buckling so in buckling so movement happens only in one direction the shape is not going to change in terms of rotation 
but whereas in case of uh, beam buckling so the, there are two types of movement one is the horizontal movement and also we have the vertical movement and the twisting effect so leading to the rotation of the cross section so that is the only difference when you compare it to column buckling so column buckling leads to horizontal movement whereas beam buckling where there is a lateral torsional buckling effect we notice vertical effect initially and then we have the vertical and horizontal effect and later the theta effect also creeping in with that all possible three moments will come into picture in case of beam buckling so in case of a column buckling u exists but theta is zero but whereas in case of a beam buckling u exists so it is not only horizontally but you also have some movement happening in the vertical direction and theta also exist one interesting thing i want to tell the student at this juncture so this lateral torsional buckling will not happen right from the first increment of the load so you need to apply some load where we see the regular bending happening which is confined to one plane then after certain amount of load applied where the beam is subjected to a certain amount of bending moment any increase in the load further leading to additional moment so we see the commencement of the lateral phenomena so that is where initially the vertical deflection later the horizontal deflection but still little bit of vertical displacement and finally the rotation so ultimately if you want to really see what is the position finally the section is occupying so we need to consider the two linear motions and then one rotational motion and also if you see here so as far as the column behavior is concerned it is only the moment of inertia with respect to weak axis that matters but as far as the beam behavior is concerned so it is the flexural rigidity with respect to x which is substantially more x means the horizontal compared to the rigidity with respect to the vertical and also if you see the flexural rigidity with respect to x direction is substantially more than gj so where g is substantially less compared to e that's what you need to appreciate but what is j the polar moment of inertia the polar moment of inertia is nothing but i x plus i y but i y is almost negligible so that is the reason i x is always be equal to i z oh, sorry i x is always be equal to or greater than j slightly greater than j oh sorry uh, the polar moment of inertia j is slightly more than i x or it may be almost equal to i x because i y y is somewhat uh, less but g is substantially less so that is the reason the flexural rigidity with respect to major principal axis compared to the torsional rigidity so this is always be greater means uh, so there is a susceptibility of the cross section to undergo torsional failure so that is where the torsional buckling will be able to say in case of a uh, lateral torsional buckling phenomena uh, as applied to this type of a problem now this is what uh, i mentioned the similarity of a column buckling with the beam buckling so in a way let us go to the next slide so the importance of uh, open and closed sections now if you see uh, i have in fact i explained the phenomena with respect to i section and a similar type of phenomena we do have in case of a channel section but uh, the difference is that in case of i section we have the centroid and that centroid happens to be the shear center so there is a point uh, where the concentration of the internal shear force which is calculated based on the distribution of the internal shear stress is concentrated so the centroid and the shear center both are coinciding so that is the reason in fact there is no torsion actually as per the shape is concerned but the torsion gets introduced it is mainly because of the lateral movement of the compression flange but if you see in case of a channel section so you know the centroid of the channel section is uh, very close to the web but uh, that is uh, inside the channel but where is the shear center in fact i have not shown here but many of these concepts uh, it is uh, rather difficult at this stage to uh, convince the students but the shear center is slightly away from the web and of course uh, it is laying along the horizontal uh, axis being the 
symmetric axis. So the resultant of the shear will be outside but the centroid will be here and wherever you apply the load on the cross section as a beam. So this particular section is not only subjected to the bending effect, it is also subjected to the torsional effect. And again it is a open section. So kindly see this channel as a open section. So the centroid will be uh, inside rather very close to the junction but if you see the shear center it will be exactly at the junction. So still we have lot lot of problem as far as these two things are concerned. So when you apply the load through the shear center so probably there is a bending effect as far as this position of the angle is concerned. But if you apply the load through the centroidal axis because the load is not passing through the shear center so obviously there is a twisting effect and similarly in case of a T section so the centroid is uh, somewhere here kindly see near the junction but uh, away but the shear center is at the junction but if you apply the load vertically as if it is passing through the centroid and also through the shear center so this element is subjected to only bending effect and there is no twisting effect but if you see these uh, closed section either the tubular section or the box section but as I mentioned, uh, uh, these sections do have a substantial uh, uh, amount of second moment of area. The moment of inertia with respect to the horizontal axis and also the moment of inertia with respect to the vertical axis. If you add these two things, uh, so they are uh, substantial. So not that uh, the weaker axis is really, really weak. So in that sense, uh, so the lateral torsional flexural phenomena is not there at all in such type of sections. So this happens only in sections uh, where horizontal second moment of area. The moment of inertia with respect to the horizontal as far as uh, this type of shape is concerned is quite substantial and obviously so we have the compression flange. If it is subjected to compression will be uh, subjected to the lateral phenomena which I explained earlier. Now let us see the factors uh, which affect the lateral stability. In fact to understand uh, this particular concept a uh, lot lot of uh, theory is required. The concept of strength of material, advanced strength of material is also needed. It is not that easy to understand, appreciate and realize all the factors so that are responsible for this type of a uh, behavior. So this is uh, an advanced topic. So probably in the advanced design of steel structure maybe in the next semester and definitely when student goes to the masters in mtech so all these things we need to study in greater details but if you see the syllabus so there is a mention that what is the behavior of a laterally unsupported beam in fact i have already explained as to what is the behavior but what are all the factors that will have an influence on this type of lateral behavior leading to instability so lateral stability means up to what stage it is stable and beyond that it will become unstable and what are all the factors that are responsible for this type of an instability leading to lateral buckling. So we have many many factors so I have just listed it but I am not able to go through each and every factors in greater details. So that itself requires about two to three class classes and uh, it is really beyond the scope of our present study. The first factor that has an effect is the loading, what type of loading and how the loading is applied on the beam and what is the support condition, is it simply supported, fixed or cantilever or is it continuous, even if it is a continuous span where the load is applied and how the load is applied, is it concentrated, UDL, so many such things connected with loading and support condition comes into picture and also it depends on the material property and the shape of the beam. So the material property means uh, the modulus of elasticity and mu comes into picture and of course the modulus of elasticity and mu is more or less constant as far as steel is concerned but when you have a composite so then the behavior may be slightly different. So this is where the material properties and also the shape of the beam. So I mentioned uh, the shape of the beam if it is in the form of an eye compared to a channel section. So symmetry comes into picture and unsymmetry comes into picture. So we have the centroid not laying on the shear center. So shear center and centroid are totally different. And also we have the major moment of inertia 
substantially greater compared to the minor moment of inertia. And of course, if you take the box section as I mentioned, so IZ horizontally can be compared to IY vertically through the centroid. So some of these uh, effects uh, can be controlled in case of uh, box sections or the closed sections or a built up section where the moment of inertia is substantially more with respect to Y axis being the vertical axis. So it also depends on the length of the beam. So the length of the beam means what is the span of the beam. And of course, uh, the end condition also plays an important role as you can see in the, uh, as you can see above. So with, with this difference in end condition and uh, with the span being different, you can also define one another span, which is the span of the compression flange of the beam. So span of the compression flange of the beam is something different compared to the span on which it is supported. The span from the point of load is different that is required from the point of calculation of the bending moment. Suppose if you say W S squared by 8, what is L? It is the span of the beam. But what is the span of the compression flange? So the length of the beam in the compression side which is susceptible for the lateral moment that is different. So there are two parameters we need to look at as far as the lateral instability is concerned. So some of these things uh, you will be able to appreciate if you take one problem. But unfortunately, the analysis or the design of such problem from the point of tackling the numerical problem is not there. So you will not be able to appreciate much at this level. So as far as the support condition is concerned, we need to identify what is the critical moment. The critical moment is uh, the minimum possible moment at which the onset of the lateral behavior commences. Again, it depends on whether it is a simply supported beam or a fixed beam or a cantilever and what type of load and how the load is applied, whether the load is applied on the cross section or onto the flange or to the bottom of the flange or is it that the load is passing through the centroid or at any other point with bracket or without bracket. So many factors do come into picture. Effective length parameter as I mentioned, so that is also one of the thing because you know the length of the beam but the end condition of the beam defines the uh, effective span as far as the bending moment calculation is concerned. Similarly at the compression flange also, the way you have connected whether it is uh, welded or even if it is bolted, how many number of bolts and what is the constraint the bolt is uh, giving rise to at the junction from the point of transfer of moment. So many of these factors are needed to be looked at. So these factors accounts indirectly for the lateral and torsional rigidity of the beam. So they form the restraint. So anyway, so this is uh, what the formula for the uh, critical moment. So this is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, is the moment at which the lateral behavior, what I explained uh, in the previous slides, uh, just starts to happen. So this is a function of uh, uh, two resistance. So one is uh, the torsional resistance square plus uh, the warping resistance square, both put under the root. And uh, the formula is uh, uh, something like this, but it is uh, uh, not that easy to understand and appreciate uh, the formula. Uh, derivation is also not that simple and it is the uh, it is really beyond the scope of uh, our present study. But what I want to tell my student is to appreciate the different uh, parameters. So kindly see here the length I mentioned, the span of the beam, effective span of the beam, IY, the moment of finish with respect to the VX axis, and also J, so the resistance to the torsion, the polar moment of inertia equal to summation of the rectangular moments of inertia. And also you have the shear modulus. So all factors are coming into picture. And also you have the constant uh, in connection with the shape effect. So if you simplify this, so this formula boils down to this. So material properties by way of E, cross-sectional properties by way of uh, IY, IZ because uh, though IZ is not reflected here, so IZ goes into J. So J is IZ plus IY. Why IY? Because that is uh, the weaker uh, um, second moment of area, the lesser moment of inertia. Sorry, the lesser moment of area or the uh, least 
moment of inertia of the cross section so everything comes into picture so that's where uh, the factors and uh, kindly see to uh, get some uh, information as to what this particular torsion is uh, torsion as you know introduces uh, the shear stress the stress which is acting over the entire cross section and uh, we have two types of torsion so just to remember we have pure torsion and the second one is called as the warping torsion so pure torsion introduces shear warping torsion introduces some sort of a distortional effect and because of that stresses comes into picture in the top and bottom flange uh, but if you see how these uh, shear stresses are flowing from one end to the other end so it is something like the flow of a water so this is what the property of a uh, shear stress uh, being uh, distributed and how it is really flowing so this is referred to as the shear flow concept so let us not worry about all these things but uh, you see here the shear stress comes into picture in all the three elements so that is where the pure torsion but whereas in case of uh, warping torsion so it is the stress only in the top flange and in the bottom flange so the resultant of the top stress in the top flange is horizontal but to left side but similarly the resultant of the stress in the bottom flange is acting in the other direction separated by some distance so that is where uh, the distortional effect uh, as far as the rotation of the cross section is concerned comes into picture and that is what you are seeing uh, in this particular cross section also an eye section connected to a vertical element where it is uh, strongly welded so this is the location where you have enormous concentration of the moment shear depending on how the element is loaded but ultimately what really happens to the cross section at the end is because of the combination of these two types of torsional effects the first one is referred to as the sine to not torsion the second one is referred to as the lasson torsion so the lasson torsion and the sine to not torsion put together is what the by moment behavior in the flanges due to the warping effect and also see the nature of the torsion so what exactly the torsion you must have appreciated so you can see the behavior kindly see the second one it is something like uh, inserting uh, a member which is in the form of an eye so into some groove or maybe through some support and later holding the other end and trying to twist the twisting effect is uh, confined to the free end but a similar type of twisting will not be able to see at the other end because it is embedded through some support so this is what is referred to as the restrained warping torsion with restrained warping but kindly see here again you are twisting this in such a way that uh, the ends are free and you are holding at the center and trying to twist it so what happens to the end so all these things you can uh, exercise it by taking a small uh, model in your hand and where the thickness is so small that it is possible to really see these types of behavior here we have the torsion but unrestrained warping you will be able to see but this is what the type of uh, warping where it is referred to as restrained warping so these are all the examples uh, where we have the torsion problem plus the warping change in the shape of the cross section happening and also the elastic critical moment or uh, the moment carrying capacity of a laterally unsupported beam so that's what we are discussing here it depends on uh, the type of the beam and the loading condition the loading condition is not only with respect to the concentrated load and the udl and also with respect to the moment so that is introduced uh, at the end and also it depends on how the moment is changing the change in moment from one end to the other end is what is referred to as the gradient whether the variation is constant whether the variation is linear non linear positive or negative positive to negative all these things do come into picture so anyway so explaining further as far as these things are concerned as i mentioned it is really really not required and also if you see the non uniform distribution of the bending moment again depending on what is the moment at the end end moments not necessary that the end moment should be equal it may be positive but it is not equal 
but the moment uh, is opposite if one moment at the end is positive the other moment is uh, negative may be same may not be same so the gradient with the same uh, nature the gradient with the opposite nature so where we need to define a factor to take care of this uh, variation and the factor that defines this type of a variation of the moment uh, and its gradient is represented by the term beta so positive beta for this type of a uh, variation and negative beta for this type of a gradation where we have not only the positive effect even the negative effect and the magnitude of the variation that also comes into picture and as i mentioned if you really want to know the moment carrying capacity of the beam and also i told you that we have the critical moment and what is the maximum moment that can be applied as a function of the critical moment so if you see here if you really do not have any influence of the gradient beta what beta have mentioned is this one and if this beta is almost zero so kindly say so this is where we have 60 percent of mcr by m and if you go further so you can go almost up to one where the elastic critical moment is almost comparable to the maximum moment carrying capacity of the beam when that happens so that happens when beta is equal to one then as beta decreases to 0 0.0 so this ratio of the two moments decreases linearly and when beta is zero it becomes 0 0.6 and it decreases further in the same linear manner extended linear manner up to beta going up to 0.5 but that is negative and then it is almost a constant up to beta from minus 0.5 to 1. So this is uh, what the pictorial representation but lot of theory behind uh, uh, this uh, phenomena comes into picture and if any students wants to do some project uh, in the final year as an analytical study related to these types of uh, uh, behavior so need to know more about this and come forward to take some good quality projects. <laughs> So in addition to these things even the types of loading also matters so if you have a uniform moment uh, you can uh, do a simple analysis but you also have most severe loading condition where the analysis is bit uh, complex and as i mentioned the moment gradients which you have seen earlier so the beta and how to define beta so we have some definition being given here depending on the magnitude of the moment at both ends and based on this how to calculate the equivalent uniform moment factor and then what is the value of m coming into picture here so the concept is definitely clear but to understand it 100 percent in a clarity manner so we need to go deep into the theory and another interesting thing as you can see so we'll be able to appreciate here so how exactly we are loading the beam so what is the level at which the load is being applied so you have the eye section but is it that the eye section as a beam is being loaded keeping the load on the top of the flange or is that the load is applied at the section only but is it that the load is passing through the centroid or is it that the load is being applied at the bottom it is something like standing on the beam from the top flange or you are holding the bottom flange and you are hanging yourself and where your own weight is uh, making the beam to bend but you are standing on the beam and you are holding the beam by uh, connecting some sort of a uh, hook to the center where the hook is passing through the centroid and that centroid happens to be the shear center as I mentioned so in a doubly symmetric sections like I so the centroid happens to be the shear center where the resultant of the internal shear is uh, concentrated to that point uh, and it is acting in the line of the external load so that is what the shear center so if this is what the type of the loading where it is being applied so kindly see the nature of the lateral torsional buckling so all these things are really not uh, true horizontal vertical and theta if you see so all these three factors depending on where the load is applied so it will be different so that is the reason whether the load is applied on the top top flange loading or through the shear center that is called shear center loading or the bottom flange loading so taking that into consideration if you plot the graph 
where you have the critical value of uh, this one expressed as a function of what is the load over this span L taking other factors of the cross section as a constant means the variation of the load with respect to this particular factor. So that is where uh, L square G J E and of course the shape factor comes into picture. So how it is varying? It not only depends on the span, it depends on the material property as you can see here. It also depends on the span and it depends on the end condition much more than that it also depends on where exactly the load is applied. So many of these factors uh, need to be studied in greater detail and we need to appreciate to know more about the lateral torsional flexural buckling phenomena. So the in addition to the factors which I explained because many of these factors uh, I explained keeping in mind the ends are simply supported. But so you can have any type of uh, uh, restraint at the support. So depending on that, the variation of bending moment comes into picture, moment gradient comes into picture. So the span of the uh, beam comes into picture, the effective span of the beam comes into picture, where the effective span in simply supported case is, uh, of course, the distance from center to center of the support. But if you see here, so it is different in case of a fixed beam. It is not only the span corresponding to the bottom where the bending moment is calculated based on the span. So it is also the span in the compression flange where the lateral buckling is uh, uh, dependent. So that is where uh, the slenderness ratio of the compression flange based on its uh, visible length also need to be uh, considered. And finally, so how to calculate the effective length of simply supported beam. What is this effective length? Suppose if the beam is simply supported over a span of say 10 meter. So that is what 10 meter happens to be the effective span from the point of bending moment calculation. But how it is supported is known at the bottom, but how the compression flange is connected to the, uh, the other elements as a beam. So that is where uh, the condition of the restraints of the support also plays an important role. So there are so many cases being discussed and many of these cases are being uh, uh, described with the help of sketches in IS uh, 800 2007 and how to get these types of uh, torsional restraint. I will just uh, explain one or two things how the torsional restraint conditions are being defined at the support. And if you take the torsional restraint and the warping restraint as I mentioned there are two parameters in the formula. So if it is fully restrained as far as the torsional restraint is concerned but as far as the warping restraint is concerned both flanges fully restrained if these two conditions is satisfied and depending on the type of loading where it is a normal loading or a destabilizing type of loading. So this is where disturbing load comes into picture, varying load comes into picture but here a constant load comes into picture. Kindly see the effective span of the compression flange. So the visible length of the compression flange into 0.7 as far as normal loading situation is concerned otherwise it is 0.85L but kindly look into the other values. So it is starting from something like 0.7 and it goes up to something like 1.2 to 2D so in this particular case. So understanding many of these things requires a lot of time and uh, maybe an introduction to the advanced design of steel structure is uh, very much needed. And then only you will be able to appreciate more in this direction of the laterally unsupported beam behavior. And also if you see in case of a multi-story building though you have a beam over some span. So there is every possibility that a concentrated load from a secondary beam comes into picture. Now we have A, B, C, D the points along the length of the beam. Assume that we don't have an intermediate uh, beams B and C. So probably if you see the buckling shape, the entire span would have buckled laterally where the lateral buckling can be defined by one particular curve. But now because we have introduced some sort of a constraint in the form of a beam connected to the main beam. So at this particular point, so the bending of the compression flange in the lateral direction is not going to happen. So this is where the buckled shape is confined between A and B as far as the span AB is concerned and similarly between B and C so it is buckling in the opposite direction 
and of course between C and D it is more or less same as that of the portion AB. But if you observe how the buckling of the compression flange over the entire length of this major beam is happening, taking into consideration so how the secondary beams are connected at uh, the two locations B and C, so we will be seeing the buckled shape something like this. So obviously the lateral buckling is not to the same extent as the beam would have undergone if there were to be no two concentrated loads through beam at these two points. So it is uh, not only the various factors which I mentioned earlier uh, are to be considered in addition how exactly the inter -beam, intermediate beam is offering restraint in the lateral direction because of any transverse beam uh, coming and resting over that particular beam. So this is also a case to be considered in dealing with the behavior of a laterally unsupported member. And uh, finally coming to uh, the effect of the shape. So what is the effect of the shape? So kindly see, so this is the flat and this is uh, the H section and of course this is the deep I section. So this is the hollow section. And uh, the flat is something like a scale. So scale is very strong in one direction and it is very weak in another direction. So again that depends on the moment of inertia. So you have seen how this uh, eye behaves and uh, this is a eye where the depth is somewhat uh, greater compared to this. So this is a closed section but this is a box section. It is a closed section, it is open section, it's, this is just an element. And if you take the area of all these things effective to the extent of 1 and how these cross sections are going to be effective from the point of vertical loading and horizontal loading behavior where the moment of inertia with respect to y vertically and the moment of inertia with respect to horizontal comes into picture. So what is the performance of the cross section as a beam when it is bent about the major axis of bending and when it is bent about the minor axis of bending or when it is subjected to twisting effect. Which one plays an important role? So anyway, so let us not uh, go by all these things because it takes time but kindly see as per the twisting behavior is concerned you find some value 100 as far as the cross sectional shape something like is concerned. So what I want to just tell by looking to this particular uh, table. So instead of uh, going for a plate section where it is susceptible to bending in one weaker plate and also in case of I section irrespective of the depth. Uh, so where IYY is rather weak. Uh, so you have to go for a hollow section where horizontally IZ vertically IY and the combined effect. So that is where polar moment of inertia J. So J is substantially higher. So that's where so the behavior of uh, uh, these types of uh, sections may be 100 times better compared to the behavior of uh, other sections as far as the twisting effect is concerned. So kindly read here. Types of cross section used as a beam showing relative values of section properties. So just by glancing the table you may not be able to appreciate everything. So because lot lot of uh, knowledge with respect to advanced strength of material, the behavioral aspects of these types of cross section and taking many of the factors which I explained earlier all are needed to know more about uh, the importance of the cross sectional effects. And another uh, uh, important thing uh, uh, is uh, what is the residual stress. In fact the concept of residual stress uh, itself is something different that need to be uh, discussed uh, uh, maybe for half an hour to one hour separately. Uh, but what I would like to mention at this uh, juncture is uh, because all your eye sections are old section. So obviously too much of uh, stressing of the uh, original materials happened. And sometimes uh, you will be welding especially at the time of uh, especially at the connections. And also you will be introducing a series of uh, holes from the point of introducing bolts. So we will be disturbing the cross section. And obviously additional stresses do come into picture. At the time of uh, fabrication too much of a heat comes into picture where the material really undergo flow leading to yielding. And even at the time of fabrication, the rolling operation, the process with which you are making the billet into a I section. So there also lot lot of stress beyond the yield happens. And when you release uh, the stress uh, 
So certain percentage of the stress will be there inside the material as if it is a residual stress. And that residual stress many a times uh, will be 5 to 10 percent of the yield strength of the material. And there are instances that it can be even more than that. So if you have a steel of yield stress FY 250 and because of the presence of the residual stress what is really available to resist the load may be 80 percent of F5. So out of 250, maybe around 200 may be available, but still in the design, we take it as 250. So you need to know what is the residual stress and to what extent it is uh, there in the member depending on how exactly the section is uh, fabricated and what is the process of fabrication and other aspects that causes the uh, residual stress to be introduced in the element. And uh, kindly see, so I have one small uh, information in the y direction. So that is where the moment carrying capacity of the you know, section comes into picture with respect to the plastified capacity. So plastified capacity means, so the section as a whole undergoes yielding where you really don't have the residual stress effect. So that ratio is almost one. But kindly see here, so as this particular value, so MCR by MP, it is the same thing. So this is where uh, the criticality of the stress comes into picture. So this is where the slender behavior has started. But all along uh, this line, this is the idealized behavior. By chance, if you have some sort of a residual stress coming into picture, so these are all the points you can see here. So instead of the point on the line, so we have the series of points available below that graph. So for any value of the residual stress, if you really want to see this ratio, so maybe if you take this particular point and go here, and if you have a point somewhere here, and if you come here, so it is not M by MP equal to one, it is 0.8. Means uh, the actual strength of the member as a moment, so decreases by about 20%. So we are not able to realize uh, MP, but we can only realize 80% of MP so because the residual stress plays an important role. So this is uh, what the interpretation of this graph. So and also we have the imperfection factor. So we have four imperfection factor in the column analysis. So that is where uh, alpha uh, coming into picture, A, B, C, D curve comes into picture. Here we have only two curves as far as beam analysis is concerned. One with respect to the road section where you have certain amount of imperfection leading to internal stress. But on the other hand, if the cross section is fabricated by plates where you are really welding it, where uh, the temperature at the time of welding is uh, too high, where internally the material has undergone yielding, so definitely certain percentage of residual stress comes into picture, which is much more than the residual stress what we have in case of a road section. So that is where the imperfection factor as far as uh, the fabricational techniques comes into pitch. So this is where uh, the buckling class if you take alpha so you have the factor 0.21 as far as road section is concerned and when that factor becomes 0.49 so it's almost double and more in case of well deck what is the load carrying capacity if you calculate it is definitely less by some percentage. So this is very similar to the alpha factor, uh, which is uh, uh, for four classifications, A classification, B, C, D classification, if you see, so there's a substantial reduction in the load carrying capacity of the column. Similarly, the moment carrying capacity of the beam also decreases because of alpha changing from 0 0.21 to 1 0.49. So these things you will be able to appreciate. So when you do some problem where everything is almost constant, keeping alpha as 0.21 and then working out the same problem, keeping alpha as 0.49, see the difference in the load carrying capacity, whether it is a problem on column or whether it is a problem on beam. So you'll be able to appreciate the effect of the imperfection factor. So many, many factors do come into picture. If you really want to understand and appreciate uh, uh, what exactly the way the lateral buckling takes place and ultimately what is the moment carrying capacity what exactly the load the beam is going to carry where it is not able to undergo the lateral buckling just at the onset of lateral buckling
So what probably the maximum load and the moment the beam can carry. So for all these things, uh, so whatever I have explained, they're all needed. Now, if you see the cross section here, just in uh, one small sentence, x x horizontal axis or z z whatever you call it so it is quite high here z z not so high but still it is more compared to the value of the same section about y but here if you see the same i section but if it is uh, put it in this fan fashion in the form of a h what is this so this is where the moment of inertia through the horizontal axis but if you see the vertical axis uh, through the centroid so there is nothing like a flange coming into picture so that is the beauty and also if you see in this cross section it is a compression flange substantial part of the compression flange able to move laterally of course here we have lesser uh, uh, area but still at some load it moves laterally because we have something called flange but if you see in this there is no flange so the movement of the compression portion the movement of the compression flange because flange itself is not there so the cross section is not susceptible to lateral torsional buckling. No lateral torsional buckling, but here it is more prone to lateral torsional buckling means so the load carrying capacity is substantially reduced. So you will not be able to attain EMP. Here also the moment may be slightly more, but still you will not be able to realize EMP because there is a buckling in the lateral direction. But here there is no buckling. And uh, this is what uh, I explained uh, uh, in one of the earlier classes and also in the beginning. So this is the centroid and the shear center. So if you apply the load through that, so it is only the bending in the vertical direction. So no torsion. So this is the shear center junction of the element, but you are not applying the load through the junction, but you are applying through the centroid. So obviously the resultant of the internal shear is uh, passing through this particular point. So from this point to this point, so there is a distance. So that is where the eccentricity of the load with respect to the cross section. And that is what the distance with which this load need to be multiplied. And that is what the effect that produces the torsion. When you apply the load like this, even though you are applying the load through the uh, centroid, where at the end of the beam as a cantilever, so putting some sort of a bracket and putting uh, a small uh, uh, nail uh, as a connector, and trying to push even manually so your section takes the shape something like this and this you can uh, do it manually provided the section is uh, so thin uh, probably it is a core form light gauge section where the dimension is so small so where you will be able to bend it in your hand and this is what the channel section centroid any load through centroid whatever the way you apply the load and this as a beam Finally, it will take the shape like this. So it has to undergo torsion, even though you are applying the load through the centroid. But where you need to apply the load so that this type of a twisting can be avoided? It is only at the shear center. Where is the shear center? So along this horizontal axis being the symmetric axis, so you have to go away from the web, out of the web. So maybe the point somewhere here, where my cursor is pointing, so this is what the shear center so only when you apply a load through this so this type of a twisting can be avoided so this is where the shear center plays an important role so that the torsional behavior can be avoided otherwise intentionally torsion comes into picture and even otherwise also because of the lateral torsional effect so we still have the torsion coming into picture so many many factors need to be looked at and thorough understanding and appreciation of the concept is required so my dear friends, so I have come to the end of uh, uh, this uh, chapter. So the design of beam. So whatever I have introduced to you in the three class, it is only the basics which are very much needed from the point of understanding uh, what is the beam behavior, the various factors that are associated with the behavior, the behavior of the laterally supported member and the laterally unsupported member and many many factors that controls the laterally unsupported behavior as per IS 800 2007 provisions I have discussed and there are quite a good number of uh, uh, small small formula available so where we need to use them meticulously to solve problems so in the next three to four classes 
I will be taking different types of problems. Uh, so from the point of analysis and also from the point of design. So thank you very much, my dear friends, for your uh, patience and listening. And if you have any questions, so you can ask. So thank you very much.